Rebecca, welcome. How are you? I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's a good job to be in. My degree was in psychology and business as a joint honours degree. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. And why did you consider or why did you work on employee engagement for your dissertation? Who was the interest? Um, well, I've always loved the crossover between psychology and business and where, you know, the role that it plays in a business environment. Yeah. Um, and I found, so I did a placement year in my third year and I found myself so engaged in the company and the work in my team and all things like that. Whereas when we all went back to university in final year, I found that actually quite a few of the people I know did, hadn't enjoyed theirs and hadn't felt at all engaged or at all kind of as if they'd gained much from it. And I think that's what kind of sparked the interest in me thinking, you know, what are those things that really do engage people and how is it so different for every person? And, and that's why then I, in my dissertation, I focused on um, psychological antecedents and organisational antecedents to engagement because they were the things I seemed to be starting to pick up on. Oh, so there were three key areas that you focused on there, I'm just checking the dissertation that I've got it correct, which was meaningfulness, safety and availability. Yeah. Can you go right. through each of those points for me? Can you share? Yeah, sure. So, um, so William Kahn is where it, it came from. He kind of argued in, it was back in um, the, I think it was 1990, um, and basically he said that um, engagement is a psychological um, state where if, you know, you need the correct um, conditions to be able to drive your energy into your work, and before you can do that and before you can engage with that task, you subconsciously ask yourself, um, how meaningful is it for me to, to bring myself to do this work and how safe do I feel doing so and also how available am I to do so and those three essentially mean um, you know um, meaningfulness is associated with um, incentives or disincentives to engage. Um, yeah. Safety is associated with um, kind of elements of more social systems so it could be that it produces predictable and consistent situations which help you engage or it could be you know, the adverse effects of the opposite that makes you disengage. Um, and availability is all to do with the resources and, you know, individual distractions and things like that that might impact the level of resources that you have that are needed to engage. And that's kind of the distinction between the three. Can you break down a little bit more on the resources mm -hmm. for the availability? Can you give me an yeah. example of where um, what they may be and where, where they might not work? Yeah, so... Um, you know, it, it's kind of availability and those resources are kind of your ability to feel as if you can engage at one moment, given the distractions that people are kind of exposed to. So yeah. <clears throat> it might be that you feel as if you kind of possess the it's the physical, emotional and psychological resources specifically that they, you know, that is found to be required to personally engage. Um, so, for example, workplace distractions include, it could be a depletion of physical and emotional energy, or it could be individual insecurity, or it could be anything, you know, in their outside lives as well. So there really are an absolute array of things that can affect, the, you know, the availability of resources you feel, um, you know, that you possess to be able to engage. When you're working with the company, can you say, um, or when you think about your dissertation in those three psych key psychological areas, can you say that there's a connection between the business responsibility and the organisation's responsibility and the individual's responsibility? Or does it, does it lean one way or the other? I think there's definitely, um, there's definitely a, com you know, a combined responsibility because where instinctively, I think a lot of the time you might just place um, a heavier kind of weighting on the responsibility of the business to make sure that the employees do feel engaged and they're you know they're doing the right practices for people and and obviously HR has a really big role to play in that um, so so there definitely is a role of the organization in that but also it's really important for the individual to 
feel as if they can express themselves in their organisation and they can, which again feeds into why the organisation has a role to play, um, because you want an environment that the individual feels able to do that. Um, but it also, if they don't, you know, voice their thoughts and opinions with, may it be their manager or whoever, peers, anyone, um, that kind of, you need the balance in that relationship. Okay, and you think the weighting is more towards the organisation, is that what I'm hearing, rather than the individual? Um, I think it's almost, I think it may start with the organisation and the way that they kind of lay almost the basis for um, employees to then be able to respond to kind of the environment that they create, for then the employee to be able to engage and be most productive and kind of so that you can also get the most out of your employees. Sounds quite symbiotic that you need one for the other. Yeah, exactly. They kind of feed into each other really. So yeah, I would agree. As you were talking there, there was a real sense of the, these psychological components really feeding into inclusive, inclusivity. Inclusive, yeah. Yeah, I'm saying the word yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah, it sound right. Um, did you did you get that that sense when you were writing a dissertation or where you're working currently that you know you need to feel included within the business, you need to feel included within your team? Absolutely, there's a sense of belonging that you know satisfying those um, psychological needs really that that gives you that sense of belonging and. And it does make you feel as if you are included in your team and, and also even in things like having good communication from management, it makes you feel as if you're included in the bigger picture sometimes, whether it could be on that scale or it could go right down to a small decision between you and one other person or your team. They're really, that, um, that inclusivity does kind of feed all the way through. Fantastic. I love the fact that you mentioned it about the manager because you know, our audience is uh, leadership uh, leaders and managers. Yeah. How much we've spoken about HR and the business laying the foundations. Mm -hmm. From my observation and working with many many managers and you know working as a manager and working as part of a team, um, I think that managers play an enormous part of this process and are absolutely fundamental. Maybe even. I don't know if I should say it out loud, maybe even more than HR, once HR have laid the foundations and that's all in place and the, there is that sense of safety, then it's almost as if they need to hand the baton over to the managers and the leaders and let them run with it. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, where, Like you say, where HR definitely help lay the foundation for the practices and and the culture and the environment that's necessary at work for people to be able to feel, you know, as if as if their work is meaningful, as if they are safe to engage and as if they have the resources to do so. It really is almost as if the baton gets handed over to managers because, um, as I say, once HR have done that, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's definitely that managers themselves have a role to play because they're the ones who can replenish the resources for their employees and they're the ones who can um you know make sure that employees feel as if they're in an environment where they are safe and you know that their manager makes sure that they they feel able to voice their opinions and um it's definitely in the way that they handle their management and also the way that they um the way that really they engage their employees that make their employees want to engage in the work itself that they're doing. It's kind of almost a, a sort of a cyclical relationship that when the manager invests in making sure the employee is, um, you know, it, they can, the employee can tell that they're cared for genuinely by their, uh, you know, their managers and things. That's when definitely they get that almost, almost return on investment sort of, not as such, but, you know, they really then will get the most out of their employees. I, I think you're right, return on, the, using the term return on investment, we don't, we're not necessarily talking here monetary value, however, the return on investment always comes back to monetary value within a business. Yeah, yeah, so, it's so true. Yeah, it, it, it might not be the focus and shouldn't be the focus of a manager when they're engaging directly 
with a uh, with a client with their team member around well-being mm -hmm. at the end of the day if you've got a, a team who are strong and who are balanced and feel safe and you know have the resources and have the platform to engage with the manager, engage with the team in open, authentic conversations, even those conversations that aren't particularly pleasant to have. Mm. If the team is that involved and feels that they can engage with you, I think there really is a, an enormous return on investment from that. I agree. You know, you can you can do all you can to get the the most monetary value out of you know with the resources you have, but as soon as you really do invest in your workforce. Yeah. You know, so much can come out of that, that if they're in a better, more kind of sound, you know, place for themselves, yeah. it comes back around on itself. It's it's one of those things that it, it just does. It's, it's It benefits not only the employee within themselves and their well-being, but it definitely benefits the organisation as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah. You have a um, fantastic quote on the um, page two in your introduction, yeah. only 15% of the world's one billion full-time workers are engaged at work. Yeah, it's it's okay. a shocking statistic that only 15% of your workforce is engaged. Yeah, it's, it's awful, really. It's, it's absolutely awful because imagine everything that you could get out of your staff and imagine where we could be whether that may be companies or on a much wider scale, if everyone was, you know, felt totally invested in what they were doing. Right. You yeah. know. Not even everyone, but if you take that an extra 5%, take it to a fifth of your workforce. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the turnover would be incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely incredible. I think one of the, the key points that I know, again, through working and working with lots of separate companies and individuals is when you present that statistic to managers, not in our company, it's not, and I'm like, it is, no, 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 it's not our company. And I don't think leaders and managers are seeing that level, 85% level of disengagement because it's become the norm. Exactly. And also, I think that's where, you know, when we were talking about the interplay almost between the manager's responsibility and the individual's responsibility, I think that's where it's so important for employees to feel safe to voice, you know, their opinions and express themselves at work because that's where you can get so much out of the relationship between the two parties when you have an open relationship like that because that's when you could also get so much more. But like you say, I think, you know, some people are blind to it perhaps because they they yeah, don't yeah. want to face the reality that actually maybe either they're not doing all they can when they're busy enough to you know doing their jobs and their work absolutely you know understandably but if they then could spend that bit more time maybe supporting the staff you know they might kind of open their eyes to these things that they didn't realize were, were there or weren't there before i absolutely agree I wonder though if it's less about not. I wonder if it's more about blinkered because if you've got eighty five percent of your workforce mm. disengaged, that's your norm. Yeah. Yes. I wonder if they see the fifteen percent who are engaged in and in Gallup's fifteen percent of engagement. That's individuals who are going beyond, over and above the day job. Yeah. Isn't it? So you know, I wonder if if, if they were. To almost to see them as the norm. Mm. I, don't, I don't like using that term normal, but in this instance, I'm using it as in if they were to see them as the benchmark. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How, what, what could they do to bring the 85% along? And I wonder if you would share mm -hmm. what a manager could do. If we go through the psychological meaningfulness, safety, and the availability. Yeah. Could you give, give some specific or share some specific examples of what leaders and managers could potentially and practically start to introduce within their team to to create a culture that is more balanced, to create a culture that is more productive, but more importantly, to create a culture where people 
want to be and are engaged within the work. Yeah. So if we were to start with psychological meaningfulness. What do you think would be some key practical points a manager may take away from today? I think it's really important to acknowledge that, you know, people at the end of the day, people are primarily motivated to seek meaning both in their work and in their life. So, you know, facilitating meaningful work not only promotes, you know, personal growth, but also actual work motivation. So it's really important that um, to note that some of the key factors which do promote meaningfulness it include even just things like challenging and, and varied and somewhat autonomous tasks that people can do at work because then they just that's what really engages them because they feel as if their work through those means their work has meaning um, which is you know it, it's not that there are there's a kind of all these really almost difficult tricky things that that people then think you know how do we do that it comes down to things like you know give people challenge and stretch them and and yeah do you know allow them to be autonomous within their work because that's when they're going to develop their own sense of meaning and you know that that sense is different for everybody but having those couple of things are found to make a huge difference for people in the workplace I've got a real sense, particularly on the autonomy side, about a sense of accountability for your work. Yes. Because if you're accountable and responsible, you tend to put more effort and energy into it because it's aligned with the success and the outcomes, the successful outcomes or the not so successful outcomes is aligned with you personally. So giving them that sense of accountability. Yeah. Also in there, there may be Nina, a need for managers to step back and find out on an individual basis what meaningful meaningfulness looks like for their individual team members and not just generalize that everybody's the same yeah i think that's really important i think it's uh, from a manager's perspective it's so important to get to know each and every one of your employees as much as you can obviously that comes with difficulties you know depending on the size of your organization naturally but the most that you can do to be able to understand what that means for that person, you'll be able to invest the right things in them and be able to give them, you know, the opportunities that will almost tick that box for them, that they feel as if they, they, you know, their work brings psychological meaningfulness for them, um, yes. you know, would, would definitely be so beneficial. Absolutely. That investment of time with your, the individuals within your team will will pay dividends in the longer term. Absolutely, yeah. Go back to that area around autonomy and being able to challenge your team members. You can only challenge team members and your team when you when they feel it's safe to be challenged. Exactly. And it's not personal slight. It's not you telling them that they're shockingly bad or rubbish act but you know you deliver it in a way that works for them which leads quite nicely on to the psychological safety yeah. um, can you share with me some practical tips again on where managers might instill psychological safety for the individuals within their team yeah of course so um so essentially people perceive this situation as safe when they trust they won't suffer you know as I said before, physical, emotional or psychological harm for personally engaging at work. So yeah. that then feeds into how important it is to have a trustworthy working environment um, because that's really necessary, you know, for, for employees to allow their authentic selves really to, to emerge in the workplace and also to make them feel engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and that essentially that plays into the importance of supportive management and really trusting interpersonal relationships between people because those things nurture someone's perceptions of safety because if they offer trust and openness and flexibility in the workplace that's what's really going to make a difference for people in you know perceiving their working environment as safe and that again tying that back into managers and leaders 
your team tends to reflect and mirror what you're putting out there. So if you're having that honest and open and putting it, almost making yourself vulnerable as a manager to show that it is a safe environment, that you know your, your psychological well-being isn't going to be damaged because you're being your authentic self. Although I think you, you possibly know better than I. I think that to a degree we all have an adaptive self within the workplace. You know, we all have our professional identity. But it's allowing that professional identity to be nurtured safely. There's nothing, I think, more fearful in the workplace than being for fear of humiliation, being made to feel like you did something stupid or, you know, and I, I've heard managers, I haven't seen this, but I've heard managers talking about teams and they go, oh, they were such an idiot. And I'm just like, that's such a bad word. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Negative, the mean word, idiot and stupid. Yeah, you're, you're never going to, you know, make people feel as if they want to. You know, people could have really, really useful opinions that they are thinking about and they are really, you know, they're on the edge of, should I express this or should I, you know, speak out in meeting or should I you know make other people aware of all these things and good ideas that I have but if mm -hmm. you feel as if you're perhaps being judged or being looked down on or you know that you don't actually you know you're you're you don't almost have the capacity to express yourself because of maybe how your manager might react you know you're, you're never going to get the most out of out of people and you don't you don't know their potential at that point so you have been an absolute star nina thank you so much oh no thank you so much for having me it was really interesting talking to you about it